Today, we introduce you to the change makers in your own backyard. Be brave and strong and fight. The people you pass every day fighting to make a difference. T the time for change is now. Cheers. And creating a community of kindness. This is Voices for Change. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm B.C. O'Neillieri. And I'm Tim Blotz. We want to begin this Voices for Change special with a Christmas story for all. This year, the Mall of America welcomed the most diverse group of Santas yet. Mm. Fox 9's Maury Glover shares how the mall is making sure Santa is for everyone. Jingle bells, a jingle bells, a jingle all the way. Hello there, my friend. Six years ago, Larry Jefferson became the first African-American jolly old elf at the Mall of America. You want one race car or two race cars? Two race cars. Two, two race cars. But this year, he won't be the only one bringing some diversity to the North Pole. Oh, I think it's absolutely fantastic because it gives children and parents a different option of selecting the Santa that they want their families to see. The Santa experience will have six Santas listening to the young and young at heart recite their Christmas wish list to St. Nicholas. But two will be African American, and one will be of Chinese descent, becoming the first Asian Santa in the mall's history. Santa's a, such a magical figure, and he, has, uh, he brings such a positive feeling that it's really important for kids to see themselves in Santa that way. What would you like for Christmas this year? Some of the Santas will not only look more like the people sitting on their laps, they will sound more like them too, for the first time, two of the Santas will be bilingual, able to speak Spanish and Cantonese, to tell children if they've been naughty or nice. To run across somebody that speaks your language, you know, it's kind of like you develop, there's a kind of a bond there, you know, it's like, oh, they, are, you know, it's, you know, not only is a language a bond, but there's also, you know, some sort of psychological bond as well. Jefferson says helping everyone in Santa's workshop broaden their horizons is the best Christmas present the Santa experience could give this holiday season. Although I'm an African-American Santa, I see just as many uh, Caucasian children, African-American children, and Hispanic children the same, you know, because I'm just Santa Claus. Thank y'all. Merry Christmas. For Voices for Change. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Maury Glover. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Fox 9. Ho, 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 ho. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd took his last breath as a crowd watched. Among the witnesses, a nine-year-old little girl named Judea Reynolds. This fall, we were able to see her story through a children's picture book. I walked to a store for George Floyd. Reading from the pages of her new children's book, A Walk to the Store, 11-year-old Judea Reynolds shares a story of fear, tragedy, and strength. We yelled at them to stop. Other people yelled too. We yelled for a very long time, but it still happens. We watch a man get killed. This story begins in South Minneapolis on the evening of May 25th, 2020. She and her cousin, Darnella Frazier, are headed to a store on 38th and Chicago when they encounter George Floyd and Minneapolis police. I thought I'm just going to the store to get some candy as a nor normal little girl. The illustrations depict the moments leading up to Floyd's death. Frazier's cell phone video capturing it all. And images seen around the world. There stands nine-year-old Judea wearing a teal t-shirt with the word love. Sometimes when I feel like I don't want to talk, like somebody will tell me, you got this. On the day before the book's release, we catch up with Judea at Ginny Bondi and Marsha D. Carter Salon in South Minneapolis. It feels exciting and good. Cause I always wanted to write my book, uh, book myself. A witness to a dark moment in history, this young author hopes to be a light. Y'all have to be scared of stuff all the time. Y'all can be brave and strong and fight for it. Yeah, because sometimes you got to fight for stuff and be brave for stuff. A Walk to the Store was co-written by Shaletta Brundage and Lily Coyle. For more information on Judea's book, head to our website, fox9.com.
www.minnesotaprivatemedia.com. Another Minnesotan is also working towards change through a children's book. A local hockey player is using his favorite game as the setting for a story about a boy who's bullied on the ice because he's black. Now, Anthony Walsh hopes the lessons in his book called Hockey is for Everybody can teach children about racism and inclusion. So thank you all for being here. At New City Charter School. My name is Anthony Walsh. I have written a children's book for you. The guest in Miss Olson's fifth grade class. To hear a book like this, I think, is important. Brings a lesson that hockey is for everybody. Racism is for nobody. The book is about a young uh, child, 12-year-old uh, Anthony. The main so. character, Anthony, is black. So everybody now pick up your books and we're going to read through it. Ultimately, it's a story about inclusion. I just hope no one says anything mean to me this time. But the story is partially his own. Hockey was my liberation. As a hockey player himself, Walsh grew up hearing racist taunts from opposing players. I would hear those kind of things, whether they would be somebody telling me to go play basketball or go eat a banana or that you just don't belong here. But Walsh, like Anthony in his book, powered back. He took the shot. Score! The Monarchs were the champions. And here, the lessons to hurt them. are about speaking up. And if you wait for somebody to, re uh, to do something. Avoiding retaliation. You shouldn't do that because it normally doesn't work and it just makes everything get worse. And racism. Viewing them as like, like good people and not judging them by what they look like. I think being able to relate to a book is important for a lot of our kids who are indigenous or who are black and being able to see that these stories are happening and that they're not the only ones. You know I belong here. Hockey is for everybody. In a game that's about scoring goals, Walsh is trying to get kids to score in life. The time for changes now. And doing it one story at a time. We're gonna go one, two, three, and smile. Because that is how we will eradicate these things like racism, discrimination, bullying. It starts with them. And again, that book is called Hockey is for Everyone. It's now in its second edition and available on Amazon. Walsh has two sequels coming out in 2023. Anthony Goes to Summer Camp and Anthony Bantle's Mental Health. A Minnesota woman's dream voiced in a tweet two and a half years ago is a reality today. After operating her bookstore for two years online and through pop-ups, she's now in a new chapter with a St. Paul storefront. Fox 9's Rose Schmidt takes us to Black Garnett Books, one of the Twin Cities' few black-owned bookstores. On these shelves at the new Black Garnet Books, you'll find works that reflect the St. Paul community. Namely, we have a large Asian community, um, as well as black community living in Rondo and Frogtown. Carrying books by only BIPOC authors and illustrators was very important to owner Dion Sims. I really feel like I was partially raised by books. And despite that, I had never walked into a bookstore and seen people of color like serving me. So this book lover decided to create a store that her childhood self would have wanted. It started out as a Google search in 2020, following the murder of George Floyd. I'd gone online and I'd searched for the nearest black-owned bookstore to support and nothing came up. The closest one was a uh, semicolon in Chicago. That was the catalyst this lifelong Minnesotan needed to start selling books herself, first online and at pop-up shops. All the while looking forward to the day she'd finally have this brick-and-mortar store for the community to enjoy. Going to a local library is okay, but just knowing that you have a black bookseller right here in your corner is amazing. In the short time it's been open, the bookstore has been flooded with families like this one, grateful to have a new black owned business to support. And I feel like books are one of the ways that we see that anything is possible and therefore the representation in books is important. The owner says she'd like to get authors to come here and get back to doing pop ups in this area. But mostly she wants the community to know this resource is here. And there are books inside just waiting to be discovered. Reporting in St. Paul, Rose Schmidt, Fox 9. And the state's first black-owned bank is also expanding its Twin Cities footprint. First Independence Bank opened its doors in Minneapolis back in April. The financial institution is now operating out of a second location. 
The site on the 2200 block of East Lake Street will serve as the bank's new headquarters and offers a full range of banking services. Now, First Independence Bank's senior vice president, Damon Jenkins, says that the expansion is part of an effort to help revitalize the East Lake Street Hiawatha corridor. The thing that I think that's, that I'm most excited about is being able to bring a sense of hope back, you know, a sense of promise, you know, and, and I think that access and the, and the um, resources that we plan to offer just really helps this neighborhood and specifically this corridor with the healing process after everything that took place over the last two and a half years. Now, Damon says that the bank is working to close some of Minnesota's equity gaps from personal loans to mortgages. First Independence Bank offers a variety of services. They are also looking to fill a number of full-time positions. One of the few full-service grocery stores in North Minneapolis is celebrating five years in business. North Market has become a go-to destination for many residents in the community. The store was able to withstand the unrest following the death of George Floyd and the pandemic. To mark their success, the North Market recruited artist Melody Strong to paint a mural, put together piece by piece with community input. Oh, it means a lot to me, especially because I live here. I actually shop here too. So um, just to be a part of anything that contributes to beautifying or connecting the neighborhood is always important to me. The North Market also held an anniversary party to celebrate their five years in business. And they continue to make food accessible to the community. There are ongoing discount days at North Market, including 50% off fresh produce every Wednesday. We have so much still ahead here on this Voices for Change special, including another Black-owned business, perfect for the season of love. Plus, we're going to tell you about some of Minnesota's change makers, from the classroom to the Capitol, and later. I will, I will, I will do better. Making a difference through music, how a gener generous gift is giving students lessons to use for the rest of their lives. Watching Fox 9 Voices for Change. Well, inside the Minnesota State Capitol, we have a civil rights and union rights activist who will now live on forever. A major dedication to a woman who helped change the world is making history. Nellie Stone Johnson's statue is the first dedication at the Capitol in more than 40 years and is the first woman of color statue to ever stand inside the building. Working to advance workers' rights and equal pay for women, she was known as a fearless labor organizer and activist in the 20th century. The state of Minnesota today was so enhanced and made so much better because of this incredible woman's life and the opportunity for us to make sure that future generations feel and understand that impact. A founder of the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party, Johnson became the first black official elected to citywide office when she won a seat on the library board in 1945. She would eventually become one of the most influential forces in the civil rights and labor movements here in Minnesota. During the dedication, the governor proclaimed November 21st will now be Nellie Stone Johnson Day in Minnesota. Well, the University of Minnesota School of Social Work started the year with a new director that will go down in the history books. St. Paul native Joan Blakey is the first black woman to fill that role. She earned both her bachelor's and master's degrees here before receiving a PhD from the University of Chicago and then going on to teach at Tulane University in New Orleans. But before all of that, Professor Blakey was homeless at the age of 16. There were people that were just, they saw something in me and they just kept pouring into me and kept believing and kept pushing and kept saying, you know, you can do this. You don't get to this place without having high expectations and pushing yourself. So I push myself a lot, um, and I have a lot of high expectations for myself. Now, Professor Blakey says interest in the social work field is on the decline, but is working to reach more students and share its value. The start of the school year marked new leadership at St. Paul's Central High School. A woman who was a student there herself more than two decades ago has returned in a new role, the principal. I'd like to think it gives me a little bit of street cred, you know, with the kids to say, I used to walk these halls. 
I know what it is to be here. For Sharice Ayers, life has come full circle. She walked the halls of Central High School as a student more than two decades ago. Now, she's the principal. What does this feel like? It's surreal. It is surreal um, to be in the principal's office, and it's my office. Um, it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. This is my senior class picture, class of 1997. Ayers' school spirit spans generations. My mother is an alum. She's class of 1970. My sister, class of uh, 1987, um, me, 97. I have about a dozen cousins here, and my own kids are here. So I understand the benefit and the power of a central high school education. What were you like as a student here? I was late. <laughs> I was late to class almost every day, but um, but I was engaged and I, and I got my work done. Her homecoming brings with it a return of the past. Mary Beth Redmond, who's my administrative assistant, she used to write my tardy passes. And so she's, yeah, she's been here at least 26 years. Well, we're thrilled to have her back. People love Central and they stay and you know, I think that speaks to just what an amazing place it is. Ayers got her start in education as a teacher. She says that closing the achievement gap remains a top priority. So one thing that I want to make sure that happens is that we are serving all of our students, that we are serving our most marginalized students just as well as we're serving those who come from privilege. Back to school. For Ayers, the new chapter begins in familiar territory. You know, I think it's, I, I represent possibility, and I represent, I hope, spirit. Ayers says that the theme for this school year is we are in this together. She's encouraging students to take care of each other and to learn how to advocate for themselves. Now, many change makers combine the need of, the need to make a difference with a passion that they love. And that's especially true for a St. Paul businesswoman who recently opened the state's first black-owned bridal store. Then combining the love of one another with a love of music. How these kids are creating their own harmonious community of kindness. You're watching Fox 9, Voices for Change. Well, it's the season of love, and many couples will pop the question during this time, which means soon they're going to be on a mission to create their perfect wedding. Just in time to help, a new shop in downtown St. Paul is filling a major gap in the industry. Lenoir Bridal opened earlier this year, and to date, it's the only black-owned bridal shop in Minnesota. They will travel. Women will travel to find that perfect dress. With the last name Love, Lorraine Love seemed destined for a career in the wedding industry. I want to make sure that um, I have what the brides are looking for. After nearly two decades working for nonprofits, she is now the owner of Lenoir Bridal, a new shop located in downtown St. Paul. Noir means black in French. And I played around with a bunch of different um, names and then I was like what does black mean in other languages and that's when I came across you know noir um, and I was like wow that is beautiful in Minnesota's wedding market love is one of only a few vendors of color and then also realizing that um, when I was doing my research that we didn't have any black owned bridal shops here in Minnesota so that was another kind of, uh, you know, driver to me being in this field right now. The arrival of her shop. A lot of the designers that I work with. Coming amid efforts to make the industry more inclusive. I'm here to cater to all women, all cultures. Born and raised in the Rondo community. What about color for you? For love, opening up shop in St. Paul is the perfect match built on new partnerships. I love the lace. Absolutely. So if you are you know, someone who is, you know, have a business idea or want to do something, do it. Don't let fear get in the way of that. Don't let, you know, your financial situation get in the way of that. Um, and one thing to know that Minnesota have a lot of resources that can support you, you know, in, in many different areas.
Love Shop is located in downtown St. Paul on the second floor of the former Pioneer Press headquarters. A great little shop too. Yeah. We Can Do Better is the title of a new song written and produced by a group of Minneapolis middle schoolers. While showcasing their talents, these students are also working to spread a message of hope. <laughs> Franklin Middle School in North Minneapolis. This is awesome. I know, I think so too. Michael Bratch is a teacher, a mentor, and motivator. Hope for the future gives you power in the present. But first, a look at the past. This was back in 2019. Through her foundation, Manuela Testolini gifts the school with the tools to create a brand new multimedia lab. Three, three, two. donation, she said, was in recognition of the philanthropic legacy of her late ex-husband, Prince. All kids can change the world. They just need the tools and opportunity to do that. From guitars to keyboards, today the lab is a hub of creativity. From this process, our students have become video editors, video producers, have taken an interest in journalism, communications. And they are tapping into their talents to inspire change. Like the sun in the summertime, we gotta let our light shine. The group writing and producing a song called We Can Do Better. It was totally so, so much fun. Angel and Isaiah helped write the lyrics. I was like, this is amazing. I was kind of nervous at first, but it, it, was, it was really cool. Others pitched in on the chorus and choreography. I'm always nervous when we're recording or shooting something. And when I saw the result, I thought, Wow, everything turned out great. At first, I was scared to do it, but it gave me a lot of confidence to do more videos. I will, I will, I will do better. The group working together to start the new school year on a high note. The past few years have been challenging for parents, students, educators, um, all the way across. And, you know, this is a, it, it feels like we've turned the page. And this song gives that fresh feeling of like, hey, this is a new chapter. All of the students that you just heard from are part of the Future Boys and Girls Leadership Club. Their video has racked up over 10,000 views on YouTube. Franklin Middle School places a focus on science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So many inspiring stories and change makers. See, those kids are going someplace, yeah, right? They are. So much fun to watch and <laughs> listen to. Thank you so much for enjoying this special with us here tonight and all of the stories of those working to make our community a better place. Take care of yourself and each other. <laughs>